Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the IISS and this webinar on climate change and water security. I'm Shiloh Fetzik. I'm an associate fellow with the Conflict Security and Development Program. And we're pleased to be joined today by some of the leading water security experts to discuss stressors, governance, and mitigation measures as the trajectory on many of these issues is being determined by climate action at COP26. It's clear from the discussions at the COP that the security dimensions of climate change, including those around water, are firmly in the mainstream. Water issues affect some of the main conflict drivers in areas that are the most fragile and climate vulnerable, from increasingly arid lands and desertification impacting livelihoods, migration and displacement, to small island developing states where salination of freshwater supplies may make them uninhabitable long before they're inundated by sea level rise. The experience of extreme drought and wildfires, as well as severe floods, are fresh in the minds of many of the major emitters as well. Just as the COP is focused on addressing gaps in ambition to reduce emissions and deliver on climate finance, there are also gaps in addressing water security needs from infrastructure to strengthening hydro diplomacy for transboundary river basins, to dealing with the array of water issues that the climate change we're already committed to will bring. We've seen resources being put on the table, for example, USAID committing to mobilize a billion dollars of public and private finance, specifically for climate resilient water and sanitation by 2030, as part of President Biden's PREPARE initiative launched at the COP. But where do the processes underway to address these threats leave us in terms of the scale of the challenge? What has the latest round of climate science told us about the threat landscape? What are the limits to adaptation, particularly in the Mediterranean and Western Asia where heat extremes are forecast? And how much will the ambition and momentum being shown so far at COP translate into addressing water security issues? What needs to be kept in mind in terms of concept conflict sensitivity as we transition away from fossil fuels, for example, as countries plan to increase hydro in their energy mix? And what are some of the politics around adaptation and climate finance that are relevant to the strategic environment? To discuss these issues and what they're hoping to see from COP26 and the implications for the global security environment, we're honored to be joined by some of the foremost researchers and practitioners in this field more comprehensive bios are in the invitation you received. We're joined by Dr. Hassan Janabi, former Minister of Water Resources in Iraq and former Ambassador of Iraq to the Republic of Turkey and a writer and lecturer on socioeconomic development in the Middle East. Dr. Sandra Ruxtall, Special Advisor to the Director General and a Senior Researcher in the Water, Climate Change and Resilience Strategic Program at the International Water Management Institute. Dr. Erika Weinthal, Professor of Environmental Policy and Public Policy at Duke University and a member of the UNEP Expert Group on Conflict and Peacebuilding, as well as a co-editor of the journal Global Environmental Politics. We'll shortly be joined as well by Dr. Angela Riccoboni, the Chair of the Prima Foundation, the Partnership for Research and Innovation in the Mediterranean Area and a professor of business administration and management at the University of Siena, as well as chair of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network Mediterranean. Following their presentations, we'll have around 20 minutes for Q&A. You'll have the option to raise your hand to ask your question live, or feel free throughout the discussion to pose your, your question in the chat box. The webinar will be recorded and made available within 24 hours on the IISS website if you would like to share it with your colleagues. We will kick off with a presentation from my colleague, Erica Pepe, Senior Coordinator for Research in the IISS Director General's Office and Research Analyst for the Conflict Security and Development Program to give us a picture on the data around water security. Over to you, Erica. Thank you, thank you very much, Ilo. So let me give uh, just a bit of background and uh, let me just say that we all know that water is the most essential element for life, 
We need it for drinking, hygiene, and sanitation, as well as to produce food, energy, goods, and services. Uh, not everyone knows that the world is in a water crisis. In fact, uh, according to UN estimates, 2.3 billion people live in water stressed countries. And astonishingly, 3.6 billion people have already have insufficient access to water for at least uh, one month each year. And this number is expected to rise to 5 billion by 2050. And already now, only less than 3% of water um, resources is fresh water. And this is becoming more and more scarce. And over the last two decades only, terrestrial water storage has decreased by one millimeter a year. And this is certainly due to years of poor management and increasing demand due to growing population, urbanization, and increasing water needs from agricultural and industrial sectors. However, on, as you said, on top of this, climate change is also intensifying pre existing water scarcity and increasingly becoming a source of stress for water security. Um, as you also mentioned, rising temperature and droughts are affecting water availability. And with floods and rising sea levels, there is a higher risk to contaminate drinking water supplies. And also extreme weather events often damage water infrastructures. So under the pressure of climate change, water is becoming more scarce, difficult to manage, and more contentious. And this has an effect on global security environment. And in fact, according to the US National Intelligence Council, the increasing effects of climate change are likely to exacerbate cross-border geopolitical crisis. And in 10 years from now, uh, it is expected that there will be a growing risk of conflict over water in many parts of the world, because water does not follow political boundaries. And in fact, 153 countries share 263 transboundary basins but transboundary water cooperation, which would play a crucial role in supporting regional integration and in tackling these regional security challenges, is actually very, very limited. And in 2020, according to the UN, only 24 countries reported that rivers, lakes, uh, and aquifers that they share with their neighbors are covered by operational agreements for cooperation. But actually, this is mostly happening in Europe and North America and uh, also Sub-Saharan Africa. But and actually, most of these existing agreements do not include yet disruptions in weather patterns and reduced water flow caused by climate change. But the problem is that in other regions, such as Latin America, North Africa, and Asia, which actually account for nearly half of world's international rivers basins and about half of global population, there is a lack of agreement on equitable sharing of water. And this is expected to increase the potential for conflicts and become a push factor for cross-border migration and displacement and to exacerbate the risk of social, economic, and political instability. And but now, as you also mentioned, there is an increasing attention to these themes. And you might have heard that at COP26, a number of world leaders launched the Water and Climate Coalition, emphasizing the need for integrated water climate management. But this could not, this could be not enough if initiatives like this and investments that the world leaders might agree on are not accompanied by effective action in the area of governance uh, and financing, capability building, and in particular in those areas of the world that are already affected by water-related disputes and institutional failures. And so this is expected to have a long lasting consequence of peace and stability and to amplify social, economic and political risks uh, and more in general, global insecurity. And so against this background and there is the need for further discussion. And with that, I very much look forward to hearing our experts view on these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Erica, for that overview of the current situation. We turn now to Dr. Hassan Janabi. Dr. Janabi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, uh, really nice opportunity to speak at this event during the ongoing uh, COP uh, on climate change in Glasgow. Um, back in uh, 2018, I was honored to speak to the Security Council during its um, 
unprecedented deliberations on climate-related security risks. It was the first time that this issue was deliberated at the Security Council in New York. It was, it was really an important step forward in addressing the new challenges, reducing risks and avoiding potential national, uh, regional, and international conflicts. Um, rising temperatures of air surface is a direct threat, in my view, to human life. But also, it magnifies the threats of other familiar risks, increases their complexity and intensity in many regions, and obviously our region, the Middle East, is included, leading to further impoverishment, displacement, food and water insecurity, and violations of human rights, creating situations of instability and, and conflicts. Uh, the declining rainfall and unsustainable use of water resources exacerbate the problem of water scarcity, causing progressive depletion of life-sustaining land resources and, of course, forced migration. Released UN statistics on the number of displaced persons and migrants for socio-economic reasons are frightening, to say the least. Poverty, war, instability, and the lack of decent means of living resulting from the spread of desertification and loss of biological diversity are the main reasons behind this mass migration from some Middle Eastern countries. Ancient human civilization arose in the valleys of major rivers due to the plentiful waters in the Mesopotamian River, the Tigris, and, and Euphrates in modern Iraq as well as the Nile River and in many places elsewhere. The rise and fall of human civilization were linked directly to the availability of water or the lack of it. Currently, we are concerned that the major river basins are subject to the greatest ever threat, mainly due to the climate change, over control of shared water resources, and unsustainable utilization of water. All this in the absence of implementable bilateral or multilateral uh, lateral agreements for the equitable and reasonable use of shared water. The indifference towards the application of the principles of international law in this area is contributing to potential conflict that should be and could be in fact avoided. Political, economic, and social problems are intensified, and they are linked to the negative impact of climate change. Observations indicate the decline of about 25% of rainfall or snow cover in the upper reaches of the Tigris and Euphrates River. The IPCC estimated the reduction in rainfall and snowfall to be between 10 and 60% in the Tigris and Euphrates River Basin. This obviously translates into a similar decline in the flow of the rivers. So coupled with increased demand for water due to uh, inter alia population growth and economic development, it leads to unfair access to water. And obviously it represents a real threat to peace and stability. The combined effect of climate change and uncoordinated operational modes of control structures have led to an alarming decline in the rate of inflows to Iraq, the direct results of which are shrinking green cover and expanding desertification. Average temperature in Baghdad and southern Iraq has risen by at least two degrees um, in the last few decades. This means at least 20% reduction in agriculture productivity. Currently, 90% of Iraq's soil, historically the most fertile, with abundance of water, is affected or threatened by desertification. Three weeks ago, the government of Iraq undertook drastic measures in response to the diminishing water resources by reducing the cultivated lands by 50%, the allowable cultivated land. 
Climate change and the depletion of water resources destroy the fertility of the soil. The inability of impoverished rural population to adapt to water scarcity and climate change is tragically weak. It's worth noting that the displacement of rural population, usually the food producers, causes a double loss, a decrease in the number of food producers on one hand, and an increase in the number of food insecure population on the other. Another tragic example of serious deterioration in the environment is in the Iraqi Delta, the historical location of the legend of the Sinbad and the Garden of Eden. It is a striking example of the destruction of the fresh water ecology, characterized by the fertility of soil, the dense forest of palm trees that changed into a mainly lifeless environment due to advancing seawater, damaging an ecosystem that had lasted for thousands of years. At the confluence of the great rivers in Mesopotamia, at the mouth of the Gulf, the marshlands of Iraq existed for thousands of years, covering an area of 15,000 square kilometers. In the face of the current water scarcity and unprecedented heat wave, this World Heritage Site is diminishing. Its indigenous population will be tragically scattered if, if not completely disappeared. There is also the destruction caused by the terrorist organization Daesh. And the damage inflicted on the people and on water installation in particular. Daesh, in fact, weaponized water and used it in the most horrific way, flooding selected areas, destroying hydraulic structures, occupying dams and reservoirs, and so on. Terrorism is thriving on instability, economic and social fragility, and the latter contribute to the spread of extremism, vengeance, and revenge. I can keep talking about this subject uh, for, for and its uh, consequences, uh, and the consequences of inaction in the face of these challenges until the cow comes home, as the said um, goes. Respecting the time allocation, I must stop here hoping to hear from you and hoping also for um, a successful um, outcome from the currently ongoing COP26. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Janabi, for your historical perspective and tying it to uh, today's challenges of transboundary water management and um, displacement and uh, the rise of violent extremism groups. Um, we're gonna turn now to Dr. Sandra Ruxtall. Uh, Dr. Ruxtall, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shiloh. Um, and thank you uh, for convening this event today. Obviously, as you've pointed out, this is a, an important topic today and always to all of us who work in the sector. And, and um, so I really appreciate you convening this conversation. So um, I wanted to go through a few things uh, right now. For one of them, uh, you've already covered actually quite well, which is um, the fact that climate change is water change. We've seen uh, this uh, thoroughly described in the sixth assessment report of the IPCC. Um, we've seen just in recent events, even in this last year, exactly how human-induced climate change has contributed to floods, fires, cyclones, heat waves, droughts, and the whole gamut of, uh, of effects that uh, where water is a thread through all of these events um, and where the most vulnerable communities are bearing the brunt of that and having the most difficult time um, building up resilience and responding to these uh, situations. And I think for me, that's, uh, that's really what we need to keep in mind as we, as we go through sort of the security element of all of this. Um, and for that reason, I wanted to go sort of through 
this concept of climate security, which is one that for reasons many of you just mentioned is, is a term that's coming up more frequently um, in development circles and disaster risk reduction circles, defense circles, diplomacy circles. What is climate security is the question to me as we think about the kind of research that needs to be done, the kinds of policies that need to be made, the kinds of investments that need to be made and what actions we need to take. So if we can better understand this concept of climate security, I'd like to take a moment to sort of break down um, that concept. So we know that the impacts of climate change and variability may not directly translate into an increased risk of violent conflict, but the anecdotes from Dr. Janabi, for example, and uh, many stories we've all seen in the press indicate that there are concerns about how this does relate to violence, conflict, and fragility. So we know that climate change is recognized as a threat or as a risk multiplier that can exacerbate existing stresses vulnerabilities and insecurities. We know that in the Middle East and North Africa, which is also where I work, um, these concerns are, uh, are particularly high. We know that this is the most water scarce region of the world and a region that is affected by, um, by social conflict, unrest, and so forth, and all sorts of trends that would, uh, would make us concerned about this confluence of factors. So, so to understand the security risks becomes, to me, a question of exposure and coping capacity to adapt and respond. Um, and when we think about this security paradigm, in some cases, uh, some prefer to use a sort of national security paradigm. Others, particularly in development, which is where I work, um, there's more of a preference to speak of human security. But I want to point out that as we think about this space, as we think about actions to take, um, both of these paradigms are very relevant. And so it's important to keep them both in mind because they are framing the operational paradigms of those who will invest in this space, those who will make policies in this space, and those who will live in this space. So um, with that, I, I wanted to go through a list of seven uh, climate security risks or they were framed as climate and fragility risks in a report that was commissioned by the G7 and published back in uh, 2015. So I think it's, a, it's helpful, it's at least a helpful thought exercise for me for us to go through each of these seven risks, just to name them, understand that they are all relevant um, in terms of scale, again, down at the human level, at the household level, but also up at the national and international level, as we're thinking about action and commitments at COP. Um, and it's also useful to consider these seven risks because again, water is the thread that runs through all of these. So just to go through these quickly, um, and, and also the point that national and human security paradigms are equally relevant in, in each of these. So as they are, first, local resource competition is really the most basic um, sort of uh, tragedy of the commons that we often think about um, as we think about pressure on resources and how that, uh, that could be due to precipitation and temperature changes, also due to population growth, of course, um, and how that could lead to competition, instability, violent conflict, and so forth, if we don't have adequate dispute resolution or resource sharing mechanisms. Second is transboundary water management, which um, Dr. Janabi has also uh, brought up, which is an excellent point, again, for us to think about from the household level, level all the way up to the basin level, crossing boundaries and all the complexities um, of dealing with uh, governance in that kind of space. And particularly, particularly relevant, again, in the MENA region where we've got two thirds of water resources are transboundary. And much of that is subterranean, which is all the more um, difficult to, uh, to govern. Next is livelihood insecurity and migration. So of course, again, Dr. Janabi mentioned this, we've got economic consequences of climate change. This means impacts on livelihoods and especially for those who depend on natural resources for their livelihoods. So this can lead to migration and uh, seeking uh, sources of illicit income and so forth. 
extreme weather events and disasters. Again, right, so this is number four um, at this nexus because we know that extreme events cause destruction, can exacerbate fragility and increasing vulnerability of exposed communities and straining um, uh, systems to respond to that. Also straining relations um, between individuals, between communities and between communities and their governments. Um, sea level rise and coastal degradation being the fifth, um, as we know uh, the economic effects and social effects of erosion, um, the, the displacement that can occur again, migration and so forth. And this is a, maybe a particular concern when we're thinking of water management in terms of urban areas and river deltas where, for example, uh, we have high population density or um, high food production in these zones. Uh, volatile food prices and provision. Again, this is something um, we've been talking about, I think, quite a lot in this last year. Um, also with COVID, as we think about the disruption of trade systems, um, we also think about what this means in terms of virtual water trade, though. This is important for us to remember here and the procurement of land uh, to secure uh, uh, food supplies for countries. We've heard stories of, of investments from China, for example, on the continent of Africa or Gulf investments in the Balkans for food production in the changing climate uh, over time. Something more to think about. And then of course, the unintended effects of climate policies. This is something I hope will get a lot more attention uh, to come as we think about maladaptation, um, investments in things, for example, like water storage, which can perhaps uh, help us deal with uh, variability in the near term, but in the long term, will that expose uh, those types of investments, expose communities um, if they experience drought, experience, if they will be exposed uh, more than usual. So the question of maladaptation is something we really need to keep at the forefront as we uh, plan the forward. So I just want to point out that we are not um, <laughs> These, it's not all gloom and doom. I think it's very important for us to think about um, uh, how the cascading impacts of climate change go across sectors at all levels, including security, in terms of security, fragility, and conflict impacts. But if we can bring our research and policymakers together to think about these in an integrated way, I think there is a lot of uh, progress to be made. Water is a part of the problem. It's also a part of the solution, but we need to think about this in a much more integrated way going forward to build these solutions at all scales. So my hope for COP25, or sorry, COP26, is rather that we will get deeper and deeper into this discussion of climate adaptation and not just on mitigation, to think about um, how we can act collectively to build resilience across borders and in communities within countries, because this adaptation is also a transboundary issue in my opinion. So thank you very much. I really look forward um, to hearing the next presentations and the questions from the audience. I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Dr. Erstall. That's a great perspective on the importance of balancing human, <clears throat> pardon me, and national security. And, um, I would also maybe just name drop that report. I'm happy it still has legs. It's called A New Climate for Peace. Um, next up, we have Dr. Erica Weinthal. Uh, over to you. I'm unmuting. Um, thank you for asking me to um, join this um, webinar today. I, um, I'm gonna build on some of the discussion from a prior um, colleagues, but what I'm gonna try to do is highlight the challenges of building mechanisms for global governance um, for addressing climate um, change and water security um, with reference to the Middle East and North Africa. And one of the things that I really wanna emphasize um, throughout my brief um, presentation is what we're really talking about is multi-level forms of governance at different levels of scales, but also connecting across different sectors, which I think um, Dr. Janabi talked about this intersection between, you know, water and the agricultural sector. Um, you know, colleagues have written about um, the COPs before talking about how we need all hands on deck for dealing with the climate crisis. And I think, you know, at this point in time, um, 
to really bring water into the climate discussions, it really is another instance of having everyone on board. Um, you know, the COP set out to do um, a number of important, um, has a number of important goals. One is seeking to achieve net zero emissions um, by the middle of the century, um, you know, accelerating the phase out of coal. You know, it is, um, we've already seen a, the Glasgow Declaration on Forests, the Global Methane Pledge. What is clear through all these discussions is climate is connected to water. And we can't disentangle um, this relationship, especially if we're gonna talk about um, a transition away from fossil fuels. Um, some of the other goals of the COP have included, you know, dealing with adaptation. And for those who focus on the Middle East and North Africa, adaptation is essential given um, the prior presentations, you know, hearing about the impacts of climate change, rising temperatures, increasing drought in the region. Um, but then mobilizing finance. How do we move from these pledges to implementation and practice? And there, you know, what does that mean um, for the countries in the MENA that may not have the financial capacities to introduce adaptation, um, adaptive measures, but also um, to fuel their transitions away from fossil fuel economies? And lastly, you know, the COP set out to deepen global cooperation. And while this is, you know, the COP is about states coming together to negotiate, you know, new pledges, new agreements. We, again, we really need new forms of governance that will allow civil society to play a role, the business sector, cities, to all be involved in addressing the climate crisis and dealing with um, water. I also um, want to note as part of this, you know, we also need to think about how we integrate the COP into other discussions within the UN, such as you know, the role of the sustainable development goals. Climate change was, is essential to that. So is building you know, peaceful societies as part of the sustainable development goals. Um, the Human Rights Council recognized in October for the first time that everyone is entitled to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, that this is a human right. Um, so what does this mean for, you know, um, thinking about this relationship between climate security and um, cli climate, um, climate change and water security, and especially for the Middle East and North Africa. So I wanna go link a few other points back to the goals of the COP. One is, you know, when we're talking about the climate crisis, we really need to think about nexus issues and water and energy, you know, are intricately linked. Um, you know, the COP is heavily focused on this transition away from fossil fuels. But, you know, as Sandra said, the climate crisis is a water crisis. Climate security is also water security. And so we can't disentangle those, but we also can't disentangle mitigation and adaptation, especially for the Middle East, because again, as you know, we heard, um, the Middle East has large infrastructure that is where you see water and energy infrastructure coupled together. So we see um, large water conveyance structures, we see large dams, we see desalination plants. So the production of water is dependent upon energy systems and energy is required for the production of fossil fuel. So if we wanna take a comprehensive approach to the climate crisis, we really need an integrative approach that looks at water and energy together. What makes the Middle East North Africa um, so different is it's so complicated. We see a range of countries. So when we talk about you know this area, we have some really rich um, you know fossil fuel producing countries that can produce water in the Gulf because they have the revenue to do so. But then you have a whole range of countries that are conflict affected. And Dr. Janabi laid out really well that what we've seen, is the weaponization of water resources, but also the weaponization of energy in these conflicts throughout the Middle East that range from Iraq to Yemen, to Syria, um, to Gaza. And this, you know, the targeting of infrastructure has in many ways eroded gains that were made in prior decades if we were to look at the Millennium Development Goals, Sustainable Development Goals. And so if we want to address the climate crisis, we have to eat, we are having to catch up in the Middle East because so many people have seen their human security eroded over decades. Um, 
you know, if you just look at Syria, um, you know, it had done really well in providing access to water and sanitation um, up until the war, you know, started in 2011 and onward. And we've seen, you know, the conflict decrease access to safe water by 50%. So the COP, you know, needs to pull back to or refocus and really think about what does climate change and water security mean for fragile states, for conflict affected countries? What does it mean for reconstruction in, in countries like Iraq or places like Gaza where, you know, infrastructure reconstruction may not be just building back better, but it may be weathering um, future conflict. And so how do you think about um, what type of infrastructure is appropriate for the climate crisis, but also for regions that are in protracted conflict at, um, for very long periods. Um, the last point I wanna um, touch on before I turn it over is the financing issues and you know, the fiscal issues that affect countries um, in the Middle East. And you know, these are raunt some of them are raunchier states who have been heavily dependent on fossil fuels. Um, they have state-owned enterprises that are really hard to reform. And oil and gas has really provided um, subsidies for the public. So if you start transitioning away from fossil fuels, you are in some ways eroding what had been um, a social contract with the public about providing a set of social services. And this will have implications from, for countries such as Saudi Arabia, who have made pledges um, to, you know, be net, you know, um, to transition away from fossil fuels, to countries like Libya, where you're seeing the climate change, climate change impacts throughout um, the country, but are still, you know, engaged in very wasteful, um, you know, um, production of oil. They still have flaring and venting of gas, which has implications for the methane pledge. Um, and, you know, I guess I don't want to take up too much time. So I just want to conclude by saying, you know, what is on the table at the COP really needs to be contextualized for a range of countries that may not have the same capacities, the same resources as those that are leading the forefront of talking about, um, the, you know, net zero emissions um, when, you know, other countries are really you know, adaptation is part of everyday um, survival. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Wanthal, for that tour of the, the water energy climate nexus and uh, how it uh, is expressed in uh, so many complex ways in, in a region affected by uh, conflict and instability. Um, I would like to encourage the audience to please uh, feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A if you like, and we will turn over to our final presenter now, Dr. Angela Riccoboni. Dr. Professor Riccoboni, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much for your nice invitation. And it is very important to talk about uh, the Mediterranean because uh, as we know, the Mediterranean is an area where the consequences of climate change are the worst in the world together with the Arctic area. In the Mediterranean area, uh, we have uh, the speed of the climate change is 20% higher than in uh, uh, other areas. So 20% uh, faster than in the rest of the world. And we as SDSN, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, I'm chairing the Mediterranean uh, chapter. And every year we produce a report on the state of the implementation of the Agenda 2030 in uh, the Mediterranean area. And if you are so good to go to the uh, website of SDSN Med, you will see that as a matter of fact, the state of the Mediterranean is very poor in terms of implementation of Agenda 2030. And especially countries from the Middle East and North Africa they are doing very poorly and very little in order to uh, be in line with Agenda 2030 and the uh, Paris Agreement and then with the, the COP26 uh, uh, commitments. So what we need to do, uh, I think that the words by Mario Draghi at the G20 are the most important ones. We need to, to work together. We need a multilateralism. We need to put together our brains, 
our energies, our laboratories, our people to find solutions. And we know that it's not easy at all, uh, but for instance, uh, the union of the Mediterranean is, uh, as you know, is a, a very important uh, international organization, intergovernative organization. They are working very hard in order to promote uh, solutions at the level of the Mediterranean, because we need to be together. We know that in order to tackle major challenges in front of us, innovation is crucial. Research and innovation are crucial. So another good example is the initiative called PRIMA, Partnership for Research Innovation in the Mediterranean area, where you have 19 countries plus the European Commission working together in order to promote research innovation in the area of food systems and water resources, because we all know that food systems are key for the future of the Mediterranean. They were key in the past, they are key now, but in the future will be even more important. So as Prima, what do we do? We have a budget of a half a billion euros over seven years, and every year we launch calls for 70 million euros in order to promote research innovation among researchers of both rims of the Mediterranean. So you have, nowadays we have funded 129 innovation projects with 164 million euros. But what is even impo more important is that we have 1,183 research teams working together to find solutions on the issues of more efficient use of, of water, on the issue of uh, sustainable farming, on the issue of uh, food value chains as a lever for the future of the Mediterranean. So this is a crucial, we need to work together. And uh, the idea is also to bring this model, the model of uh, putting together researchers beyond sustainable uh, agri-food systems, but also in other fields such as uh, energy such as uh, you know, renewable energy and uh, adaptation to climate change. So I think that uh, these efforts to uh, put together uh, citizens, sorry, uh, energies, money, uh, laboratories, innovators is, is crucial. So we have uh, produced interesting uh, projects on uh, the use of water. This is the topic today. And in terms of uh, of uh, technological solutions to be more efficient in the use of such an important resource. So this is the first message. We need to work together. Prima is a good example. We need to enlarge it to other fields. The second message I would like to, to deliver today is about the importance of the nexus. I heard something about that before. The nexus between water, energies, energy, as it was said, but also food and ecosystems. This is what we call WEFE, Water, Energy, Food, Ecosystems, Nexus. And we have already funded 17 projects on this issue because uh, the danger, the risk is that we do not put together these issues while for the future of the area are so important because uh, as it was already said, we need a lot of water to produce energy, but also to, we need a lot of uh, energy for our uh, future needs. And what is uh, possible is that in order to be able to uh, tackle the challenges in front of us, we could produce energy in the Mediterranean and then bring it from uh, uh, Northern Africa or South Europe, if the temperatures goes up as the forces they are going, we are able to uh, create uh, energy through renewable sources. And with these renewable sources, we can bring energy around Europe, but also we can use this energy for other purposes besides production, but also in the hydrogen cycle. So there are 
many, many opportunities linked to the a good management of the welfare, water, energy, food, ecosystem, nexus, and innovation is crucial in this, uh, in this field. So uh, I don't want to spend too much time uh, and I would like to stop here thanking the organizers and uh, just highlighting that only multi multilateralism can be useful to tackle our issues. Thank you very much. Back to you now. Thanks so much, Dr. Riccoboni, for, for stressing the nexus nature of these issues and bringing in the ecosystems dynamic as well, um, and uh, the importance of networking existing capabilities and using um, the expertise that's there, especially in a region that can sometimes suffer from from brain drain, which affects its, its governance capacity. So thank you for that. Um, we turn now to the Q&A, and we have a question here from Benjamin Petrini, WIWS, asking, in the context of protracted conflicts in MENA, what are the incentives for governments to address climate security issues when some of them are fighting for short-term survival, Syria, Lebanon, et cetera? Um, we can perhaps go in the same order uh, as the as the speakers, or feel free to jump in. I'll offer the floor first to Dr. Hassan Janabi. Yeah, I'm, I'm very sorry. I um, um, I missed part of the question, uh, um, Sheila. Uh, you can find it in the Q and A at the bottom of the screen. Uh, any other uh, panelists would like to comment on this? I'll give it a try. Um, so uh, thanks for this question. Uh, it's a good question. You know, we're, we've already seen, I mean, I'm sure everyone on this panel will, will be able to provide different anecdotes of, of how this is relevant in these, in these situations, action on these, uh, on these issues is relevant in these different situations. One issue that I happen to be working on more lately is the issue of migration. Um, and I think that when we think about um, demographic change, so the, 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 recent IPCC report pointed this out well that, okay, we've got um, human induced climate change. We also, I need to couple that with demographic factors. So in this case, it's a matter of, we've got growing populations. The MENA region is certainly no exception to that trend. Um, and so therefore it makes it even more urgent to develop good water management systems, um, resilient infrastructure and so forth. Um, so, and, and this is, so we've got the population growth, but in addition to that, we've got population growth. And I know that lots of people like to refer to the Syrian example as if migration, rural urban migration uh, uh, was the trigger for, for the war. I'm not disputing that there was a dimension of that, but the reason for the migration we have to investigate what was happening with water management in, when the migration occurred and how could that have been done uh, the same differently, what have you, in terms of uh, mitigating the risk of people moving. But then we also in the region have the question, because this is a region where virtually every country is hosting um, displaced persons for some reason or another. Um, and so how do we make the host communities more resilient to those types of changes? So these are a lot of ways where I think it really makes water management and water policy and water investments even more complex, but even more important in, in this region. And for those reasons, I do think that it is, um, uh, I, from what I have seen, the discourse of, of governments I've worked with is this is perceived as a security issue and therefore mobilizes uh, concern and action. And also among the donors, they're starting to articulate these as security issues, um, water security issues, but how this trickles into other domains of security. So uh, hopefully that was a helpful starter. This is only one of many reasons why I, I think there, there, there are incentives to act, but I'll stop there. Thanks. Mr. Uh, Dr. Janabi, 
Uh, yes, please. I I uh, I heard the last part when you mentioned Syria and Lebanon and and, and Yemen, which means that I mean these are countries um, and very much um, in, in trouble. So what can they do to address um, you know these new challenges? Of course, the the, the new challenges and the issue of uh, climate change and what have you, of course, contribute to the intensity even of these these problems. But we cannot forget them, regardless of you know the priorities of the countries are different. But I give you an example. When I was a member of the cabinet um, uh, in 2017, I I warned uh, against um, a feasible drought that we we forecast the drought that is going to take place uh, in the year after. So I I made really powerful presentation, um, uh, trying to allocate some you know resources and, and alert the government and the people. Um, to take measures to try to uh, mitigate and minimize the impact of the upcoming drought. So when the prime minister asked me, when do you expect this the drought to hit? I said, next year. He said, next year? That's 12 months from now? I said, yes. So he laughed, basically. And the, the entire cabinet, they laughed. They, they said, we, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next week. And you are thinking uh, one year ahead. So, But, uh, of course, the, the drought hit and hit hard. So I was managing a ministry where no water, minister, minister of water resources, but there was no water. And also we were victim of the Daesh attack. We had no money. So, but by the end of the day, I think everybody realized that we need to be, we need to be ready regardless of how um, difficult the challenges that we are facing. We, we cannot forget these uh, unavoidable challenges. So, if, if the, our messages, uh, they don't get through immediately, but they will have an, an impact. So we need to keep going. We need to keep alerting people to this and trying to allocate um, um, resources and, and what have you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Janavi, for those uh, informed remarks. Um, another question here, given the important role of non-state actors, both militias and NGOs in the region, and often unstable governments, how do governments move forward with longer term planning and policy? Uh, in a sense, Dr. Nabi, Nabi you addressed that. I wonder if you'd like to come back on, on that one very briefly. Yeah, well, yeah, this is, this is you know, the same thing. I mean, the, 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 my, my previous answer applies here. I mean, non-state actors, what can, what can you do? You cannot just submit and wait for miracles to happen. You need, uh, you need to do um, the minimum, you need to do uh, what is required to do in, uh, within certain circumstances. But uh, I think bringing stability uh, is, uh, um, is a major issue. Um, Non-state actors, they, they become very active. There is, you know, um, unstable situation. There is uh, um, um, displacement, impoverishment. There is no water, no food, and what have you. So it is a complex, uh, a complex issue that needs to be um, addressed. And in our case, uh, I mean, we think of ourselves like a democracy because we, we go and we elect people and things like that, but we cannot form, um, you know, a majority government. So basically, and in Iraq, for example, we don't have, uh, we don't have a position. Everybody is in the government. So this also weaken the ability of the state um, uh, to act. And because of you know foreign interventions, regional and international interventions in, in Iraqi um, um, affairs, this makes it uh, difficult. But people, basically the majority of the people, are coming together. But you know it's very painful uh, to uh, um, to do and to work and to produce um, positive results. But uh, we cannot give up. I mean, there is no miracle uh, solutions to. Uh, to the challenges that we are facing, but the will uh, and uh, um, you know, whenever, uh, of course, the international support is uh, is important. But we have also international intervention and required. We don't require every aspect of international uh, presence in, in Iraq. We need to coordinate um, coordinate that. Yes. Thanks, Dr. Janabi. In our final minutes, we have one more question. Uh, which I might turn to um, Dr. Riccoboni and Dr. Weinthal. In terms of the design and implementation of adaptation policies in conflict-ridden countries, 
how to prioritize the most needed issues to tackle amid limited financial resources and the complex interconnection of climate change with other domestic stressors of insecurity. Uh, would either of you like to go first? Dr. Weintel. Sure, I'm happy to start. Um, you know, so, so from work that we've done on water and post-conflict peace building, um, you know, one of the issues that always comes up is the lack of incentives for at least the private sector to invest in the in water infrastructure in um, conflict um, co affected countries or fragile states, just because there's very low rates of return. And so this is really one of the challenges for um, really thinking about adaptation in you know many parts of the Middle East and North Africa, is how do you incentivize investments in much needed infrastructure, especially when, you know, going back to the other questions, there's a chance of another outbreak of conflict. And so in some ways, what I would suggest is that countries have to move away from these large infrastructure projects and really think more about decentralized forms of water access, energy access. We're seeing solar being introduced in many parts of the Middle East and North Africa. Um, smaller grids, um, smaller water systems, and really looking at what's happening um, among communities themselves and how they're coming together um, to really address um, water access and water security. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Rika Boni? Well, I think that, uh, as I said before, we need a major plan by Europe for Africa from the Middle East. We need to uh, count on the, as I said before, the multilateralism. We need to, I mean, intervene in order to make uh, uh, investments in those areas because without major investments in those areas, we will never have a stability and peace. And I don't think that the private sector would be able by itself to build what is needed because uh, the, the, the size of the intervention, the difficulties to have a return make it very, very complex to rely upon private sector. So I think that we, what we need is a major effort by Europe to intervene in these countries in order to support in the building of infrastructures. Otherwise, we will never have stability. We will never have a, a peace and we will have more risks of migration, uncontrolled migration flows. So I think that what is needed is really to make Europe a major player in the in the area to support, to help, to work with these countries in order to have a, a better future. Otherwise, I think it's not easy. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Kibani. We're just at the end of our time. Uh, so I will just note that we've heard a lot of important points today around, uh, around how water risk, risks are endangering human security on the nexus nature of the challenge, uh, connection with infrastructure, energy, water, food ecosystems, and the importance of innovation and research and need for smart investment that's informed by risk analysis and, and conflict and security analysis as well. Um, the, the IIS will be continuing its work on climate security. There's a webinar on Friday on water, energy, security, and peace, the Green New Deal as a path to climate security and peace among Israelis, Jordanians, and Palestinians. And on behalf of my colleagues at WLS and our, and our audience, thank you so much again to our speakers, Hassan, Erica, Sandra, Angelo, for making the time for this discussion. Thank you all for joining and goodbye. <laughs>